This is tape number one, side one of the training program number 10-1B on the IBM Selectric typewriter. It is a continuation of the training program number 10-1A and it covers the operational theory and the adjustments of the cycle clutch or print clutch. At this point you should be viewing slide number one of the various clutches used in the IBM Selectric typewriter, the cycle clutch is by far the clutch which is used most often. It has to operate whenever the machine prints. Think of it as a print clutch. First we will point out and locate all of the mechanisms which are powered or driven by the cycle clutch. Then we will dismantle the cycle clutch for a close look at the components and finally, we shall reassemble it, performing the adjustments as we go. Slide number two. In the previous training program, we saw that the torque provided by the motor, which we call positive power, is made available from the center of the power frame all the way to the indicated right side of the typewriter. We examined and then labeled the various clutches according to their function in the typewriter. By now, it should be obvious to you that this shaft is really the drive or the power shaft of the IBM Selectric typewriter, in spite of the fact that it is called operational shaft. Slide number three. This is a cycle clutch assembly. Its primary function is that to select and to print the characters. But it has some additional functions, such as ribbon lift, ribbon feed, to activate the escapement, and a few more. The important thing to keep in mind is that very many mechanisms are affected by the cycle clutch adjustments. The cycle clutch, or print clutch, consists of a spring friction clutch which operates exactly in the same manner as the shift clutch, which we've studied earlier. This means that the clutch spring is kept distended or opened when the clutch is not engaged and that the spring will collapse or shrink its diameter utilizing its own tension as soon as the spring is released or unlatched. When the cycle clutch is engaged, it transmits torque to the cycle shaft, located immediately to the left of the clutch. As a result, when the cycle shaft rotates, it does so in the direction top to the front. Slide number four. The job of the indicated cams located on the cycle shaft is that of carrying out the character selection. The cam on the right is called the minus five cam and the two cams on the left which are exactly alike and have only one cam follower are called the plus five cams although this name does not describe their function completely. Notice that all of these cams are double lobed which means that for each revolution of the cycle shaft we get two cam follower oscillations. At the end of the cycle shaft, on the left outside of the power frame, there's a gear, which is also driven by the cycle shaft, and for that matter, the cycle clutch. At this point, be sure to familiarize yourself with the cam followers for the cams mounted on the cycle shaft. Take as much time as you need, whenever you need it. Make it a point to become thoroughly acquainted with all of the pointed out parts of the machine. This is one of the few instances in life where the closest possible familiarity will only aid you. Thus, don't hesitate to pause or stop your tape player often. Slide number five. As mentioned, if we follow the cycle shaft towards the left, we find that it extends towards the outside of the power frame where it drives the cycle shaft gear. If the gear train on your machine is covered, remove the cover at this point. 
slide number six. Here, the yellow pencil indicates the cycle shaft gear, which drives the gear train. Gear train is the name given to this aggregation of gears. As we trace the propagation of the driving torque coming from the cycle shaft gear, we find that it branches off and ends at two shafts which are indicated by the red pencils. On the lower right, we find a gear which is mounted onto a shaft called filter shaft. Furthermore, we find that since the cycle shaft gear rotates top to the front of the typewriter or clockwise, and since the total number of gears in the chain is three, an odd number, that the filter shaft gear, and for that matter the filter shaft, must also rotate clockwise or top to the front. As we examine the chain which leads to the upper gear mounted on the print shaft, we find that it has an even number of gears. Thus the direction of rotation for the print shaft is reversed, namely top to the rear or counterclockwise. Notice also that the upper gear, or the print shaft gear, is only half the size, or has only half the diameter, or half of the number of teeth of the other gears. This means that for every revolution of the cycle shaft gear, the print shaft gear, and for that matter the print shaft, will have to perform a complete revolution. Conversely, for every 180 degrees of rotation of the cycle shaft, the print shaft has to rotate 360 degrees. Slide number seven. This shaft is called filter shaft in spite of the fact that in the region indicated by the red pencil, it is primarily a very wide double-lobed cam. The filter shaft extends all the way towards the right side of the machine, yellow pencil, where on later machines there are at least four more cams. The wide double-lobed cam portion of the filter shaft indicated by the red pencil is the portion of the shaft which gave it its name. Whenever we print a character with the IBM Selectric typewriter, there are a total of seven different selector latches from which the correct combination of latches has to be chosen in order to cause the type element to tilt or rotate or print the position which holds the character chosen by the typist. One of the seven latches is used to select the correct printing velocity for each character. It turns out that for five of these six latches, the machine uses negative logic in order to come up with the correct combination of selector latches. This means that the machine picks out the latches which it does not want to use in a particular operation rather than pick the latches which it does need in order to select the correct character. In short, the machine filters out the latches which it does not want to use. This filtering job is carried out by the filter shaft, or rather, by the wide double-lobed cam on the filter shaft. Slide number eight. As we track down the other cams of the filter shaft, we find that from left to right, the next cam is a spacebar inhibit cam. It cuts out the spacebar mechanism during printing operations. Slide number nine. This cam can also be viewed from the top rear of the machine in the operational shaft cavity. From this position, you can obtain a much better view of the cam follower. Slide number 10. The third cam on the filter shaft is the printing escapement cam, indicated here by the blue pencil. The cam follower for this cam holds the already familiar escapement link, yellow pencil. Thanks to the printing escapement cam, we space the carrier one step towards the right every time we have finished printing a character. The only exception to this rule are the so-called dead keys used for accents and markings.
but they are not used in the English language. Slide number 11. The fourth cam on the filter shaft, this one already located outside the power frame, is the velocity control mechanism restoring cam. In order to prevent certain characters with small printing surfaces, such as the periods and commas, from cutting through the paper, the velocity control mechanism, when released, regulates the momentum with which the element hits the paper during printing. The velocity control mechanism restoring cam has the job of reloading the spring tension which operates the velocity control mechanism after each time it has been used. Slide number 12. The fifth and last cam on the filter shaft, indicated by the blue pencil, is the shift mechanism inhibitor cam. During all printing operations, the type element is firmly held in position by a mechanism called the detenting mechanism. This is to ensure the best possible alignment of characters. The shift mechanism is nothing more than an extension of the rotate mechanism, as we will come to fully understand in package number 4-5. If during a printing operation in which the element is detented, we were to attempt a shift operation somewhere in the chain of parts leading to the element, some more delicate part would have to give or possibly sustain major damage. By inhibiting the shift mechanism during printing, we prevent this sort of mishap from occurring. The yellow pencil indicates the cam follower, which will prevent the shift ratchet from allowing the clutch engagement during printing operations. Green pencil. On your machine, you may find an earlier level mechanism performing the same function. At this point, you should take time out in order to acquaint yourself and review all of the cams on the filter shaft as best you can. The cycle clutch will have to power all of these cams during each and every printing operation. Slide number 13. Inside the carrier and around the print shaft, there's a tube which supports three cams. This tube is called print sleeve. The print sleeve is key to the groove in the print shaft so that it has to turn whenever the print shaft turns. On the majority of the machines, we have three cam clusters rather than simply cams mounted onto the print sleeve. The leftmost cam yellow pencil, is the ribbon lift cam, or cam cluster. Regardless of which kind of ribbon or even the correcting tape, the lifting of ribbons is accomplished by the cam or cam cluster on the left side of the print sleeve. The cam cluster located in the middle contains the detent control cam and the ribbon feed cam. The cam cluster on the right, indicated by the green pencil, is the print cam cluster, or simply the print cam. On typewriters equipped with a correcting tape mechanism, we find an additional cam lobe on the right side of the sleeve, which performs the function of feeding the correcting tape whenever it has been used. At this point, you should hand cycle the machine and again familiarize yourself as best you can with the various cams on the print sleeve. Trace as many of the cam functions as you can make out and keep in mind that all of these functions are driven by the torque or the positive power delivered by the cycle clutch which you're about to study. Slide number 14. As mentioned before, the cam cluster located in the center of the sleeve contains the detent and the ribbon feed cams. The camming surface used for detenting is indicated by the yellow pencil. Notice that it is located on the side of the cam and that it exerts left to right pressure onto the sleeve. 
The green pencil indicates the surface which constitutes the ribbon feed cam. Slide number 15. We shall now engage in disassembling the cycle clutch for the purpose of getting to know the nomenclature and the theory of operation of the clutch. But before we remove any of the gears, examine the engagement of these gears. There should hardly be any play between the teeth of the gears. This condition is referred to as minimum backlash. Slide number 16. Let us first remove the C-clip of the upper idler gear, shown here. In reality, we want to remove the upper idler gear only in order to get access to the mounting screws for the lower idler gear. We need to remove the upper idler because the nylon teeth on the upper gear would very likely sustain damage if we attempted to remove the lower idler gear without first removing the upper one. Depending on the model or the level of the machine which you're using for this course, you may not have the C-clip. You would then have to loosen the stud which holds the upper idler in its position. Slide number 17. Now remove the lower idler gear by extracting the indicated screws. Be sure to use a screwdriver that is wide enough in order to prevent the screw heads from becoming marred or otherwise damaged. Slide number 18. On the 11 inch machine, all we have to do is to remove the nut on the bolt which holds the lower idler gear in position. The bolt which doubles up as a shaft will then also come loose. Slide number 19. We have now cleared the way for the removal of the cycle shaft bearing plate. But before we go at the screws, which hold the plate in its position, let us examine what else is held in position by the same screws. Notice the part indicated by the blue pencil. This part is one of the clamps which holds down the dust shields for the space under the carrier. While its position is not very critical, it nevertheless is adjustable and must firmly hold the dust shield in place after we get done with the reassembly procedure. The screw indicated by the red pencil holds only the bearing plate, thus it can be removed without any further consideration. The story is quite different for the screw indicated by the green pencil. On the outside of the power frame, this screw holds a protective shield over the gear train. For safety purposes, it is very important to reinstall this shield on the 13 and on the 15 inch machines. Slide number 20. Again, you have one less part to worry about on the 11 inch machines. Slide number 21. The same screw which holds the safety shield also holds the check ball for the cycle clutch. Just as it is with the ratchet clutches and the shift clutch, the cycle clutch needs a clutch latch and a clutch check ball in order to be able to hold the clutch spring under tension. The yellow pencil indicates the point of engagement between the cycle shaft or cam and the check ball on level two machines. Slide number 22. This is how the same function is carried out on level one machines. The check ball ratchet as well as the level two check ball and cam system offers four positions in which the check ball can prevent the cycle shaft from turning top to the rear. We pointed out earlier that the cams on the cycle shaft are double lobed. 
This means that the cycle shaft only performs one half of one revolution each time it is used for the printing of a character, and that there are two home or rest positions for the cycle clutch. In both of these positions, we will need the check paw in order to hold the cycle clutch spring open or disengaged. This takes care of two of the check paw ratchet teeth. The other two are used for one half cycle position markings of the cycle shaft. It is important to mention that the term cycle shaft is actually a misnomer if we understand cycle to mean revolution. On the IBM Selectric typewriter, the cycle shaft is set to cycle every time in which it performs a printing operation. For every printing operation, however, the cycle shaft only performs one half of one revolution. If we then consider that the check paw positions add up to a total of four positions, we know that they are only one-fourth of one revolution apart and not half a revolution. Be sure to remember that on the Selectric, a cycle shaft cycle stands for only one half of one revolution of the cycle shaft. We could also say that one character printing operation represents one cycle for the cycle shaft, and that one cycle for the cycle shaft is in reality only one half of one revolution of the cycle shaft. Slide number 23. To remove the check pawl, let us first disengage the check pawl spring, as shown here. Slide number 24. At this point, you can either remove the spring from the machine altogether, or simply get the spring out of your immediate working area by trapping the spring on the outside of the power frame indicated by the yellow pencil. Slide number 25. Now we can finally remove the check pawl mounting screw. This check pawl mounting screw is far more important than meets the eye. For one thing, we note that it is screwed into the power frame, which really makes it part of the power frame. Since the right end of the screw holds the check pawl, and since the check pawl is used as a reference for the home position of the cycle shaft, we deduce that the rest positions of all of the cans and shafts which we studied earlier use the check pawl and this screw as the ultimate reference point. You will hear many times that adjustments of the cycle clutch, of the print shaft, of the filter shaft, as well as the individual cans on the filter shaft, must be made with the cycle shaft against or in its check pawl position or home position. And all the while, the check pawl is held in its position by the check pawl mounting screw. At this point, please invert the position of your sound cassette so as to continue by playing cassette one, side two.